Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Get ready, folks. We have good, good, and good martinis for conservatives to close out the work week. We also want to let you know that today we're sponsored by Simply Safe Home Security for 24 7 protection you can really trust. Go to simplysafe.com slash ricochet. And as we uh, wait to get into the first martini here, just a quick follow-up on yesterday. Uh, Jim was uh, giving me a little bit of grief, and for very good reason, as the uh, Chicago Bears signed a backup quarterback from Tampa uh, for nearly uh, $15 million a year over three years. Uh, We were talking about what the Bears were going to do with the rest of their quarterbacks. They ended up cutting Jay Cutler. On Thursday, Jim, and I know this will make you excited. Here's Ian Rappaport from the NFL Network. Well, the New York Jets do have some interest in Jay Cutler, and I'm told he has interest in them as well. He is the best veteran quarterback option out there. I would expect some sort of contact between Cutler and the Jets at some point soon. So basically we're at the seventh grade study hall version of this, Jim. Both sides know that they like each other, and, and, <laughs> and, maybe, and maybe at the next junior high dance they'll actually talk to each other. We'll see. You know, uh, Greg, it's fake news. It's fake news. It's sad, pathetic. The media making up crazy stuff. I'm just going to remain in absolute denial until it actually happens. So, All right. We'll keep it there. We've had a lot of sports this week. And while we love talking about it, that's not exactly what we're paid to do. So let's go on to the first good martini. The top U.S. commander for the Middle East told Senators Thursday that he has completed an exhaustive review of the Yemen raid that killed a Navy SEAL and has concluded there were no lapses in judgment or decision-making surrounding the operation. General Joseph Vattel, who heads U.S. Central Command, says he sees no need for additional investigations into the January mission that triggered debate in Washington over what went wrong and whether important intelligence was actually gathered. It was the first military raid authorized by President Trump. Vattel, who presided over an internal review, said that he was, quote, looking for information gaps where we can't explain what happened in a particular situation or we have conflicting information between members of the organization. I am looking for indicators of incompetence or poor decision making or bad judgment throughout all of this. In the end, he said, quote, I was satisfied that none of those indicators that I identified to you were present. I think we had a good understanding of exactly what happened on this objective, and we've been able to pull lessons learned out of that that we will apply in future operations. He said there was no need, again, for an additional investigation, and he does believe the U.S. gained valuable information on al-Qaeda militants. So, Jim, NBC, if they had a conscience, would have egg on their face at this point. It seems pretty clear that the military is satisfied with what happened in Yemen. Obviously, we regret the loss of life with the heroic service of the Navy SEAL. Uh, But from what we can tell, um, all the hysteria about this mission being unsuccessful seems to be unfounded. It is. And this is where the media's animus towards Trump really gets destructive. And this is coming from a, a you know guy who was never Trump during the election that, look, when something like this happens, did something go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> In other words, you, you never design a plan hoping to lose somebody uh, or expecting to lose somebody. On the other hand, this is combat, this is war, and the other side gets a say in what happens during that. You never know what's going to happen in terms of the opponents return fire and, and things like that. So how do you separate the fog of war and what we might call just natural consequences of armed combat in a, in a, uh, in a mission like this versus a, a mistake that was avoidable uh, versus something that really reflected um, insufficient preparation or bad planning or bad judgment or something like that? Well, this review is rather reassuring. It tells us, you know, that this, is, no, this, is with, this is very much, for lack of a better term, normal, that when you run a dangerous mission in a foreign country – there's always the risk of casualties. Sadly, we had one in this case. As President Trump said, they're etched in eternity. Um, we should always be studying these things to see what happened. But I remember, you know, almost immediately, it was like, you know, Trump's first covert mission goes terribly wrong. There was this over the top and a, and a strikingly um, uh, vehement desire to tie this directly to Trump, that somehow it was his fault. That somehow the president hadn't provided the cover fire he was supposed to or something like that. Um, And I I did an exchange with a guy on Twitter where I said, "Okay, um, I know you think Trump is incompetent. But like what what did he not do with this mission that he should have done? What? And I I I kept kind of you know pecking at this guy to say, all right, tell me what the decision was. Well, he shouldn't authorize it. You know, know, the guy actually came back and said, you know what? You're right. Uh, It really wasn't Trump's decision. 
And you know, it, I, I believe that violates the Twitter charter, uh, Greg, for anybody to ever admit that they were wrong or that they uh, acted without complete information. Now, look, does this mean? You know, and I'm glad they're doing this full review. You know, this this is a circumstance where it doesn't mean it's it's okay or or we should all shrug this off. I'm sure the military looks at every casualty and says, what happened, and how can we do our best to make sure this doesn't happen again. Having said all that, um, this was fairly standard. And the fact that it's got, you know, there's some reports, including that in the New York Times, that this recovered valuable in intelligence about Al Qaeda in Yemen uh, and a group that has been trying to smuggle bombs onto airplanes and uh, things like that. Look, this is what this is the job of the military is. They did their job. They achieved a certain level of success, but also at a at a cost that some people will debate will be too much. Unfortunately, you can't. There is no such thing as a casualty-free war. Um, unless you want to make everything with drone strikes, which has its own, you know, uh, separate problems. So um, is more is this a good martini? It's really it's a reassuring martini, uh, and one that I think you're right does kind of point out how overwrought and in fact, instead of clarifying, obscuring a lot of the uh, a lot of a lot of the early media coverage obscured what was the, the truth instead of uh, illuminating it. Thank goodness the current media wasn't at Normandy. Can you imagine the reaction to that? Was it Eisenhower had uh, two letters written? Yes. One for success and one letter of resignation for failure. I right. mean, this is, you know, this is this is how war works. Failure, you know, you know, failure is not an option. Sadly, failure is always an option, right? You don't want it. You wouldn't accept it. But there's always a chance that you will fail in your objective. So um, there's kind of this a, a lack of understanding of, of war. And this is coming from a guy who has not served in the military and has no pretensions of being a military or military history expert. Uh, in this, Greg, I know you've done a bit more of this, and it kind of would be nice if the uh, media and the citizenry could understand the realities of military life and combat uh, the way the military itself does. Yeah, I have the chance to interview veterans on a fairly regular basis, and their heroism, their humility is amazing. And it's very rare uh, that they talk about the politics involved of the war. I've interviewed a lot of Vietnam vets. Uh, they were scarred by what they came back to. But uh, in terms of the politics at the time, they were fighting for the guy to the left and the guy to the right of them. And uh, that's exactly how they went to their service. And you hear that regardless of the conflict that these folks were in. So uh, always, always uh, uh, giving tribute to those who will actually go into those dangerous situations. Uh, let's stay in the war on terror, but move a little bit uh, to the West, I guess, uh, for our second good martini here. This is from Reuters. U.S.-backed Syrian forces said on Thursday they were closing in on Islamic State-held Raqqa, which is the capital, and expected to reach the city outskirts in a few weeks as a U.S. Marines artillery unit deployed to help the campaign. The Syrian Democratic Forces, a militia alliance including the Kurdish YPG, is the main U.S. partner in the war against Islamic State in Syria. Since November, it has been working with the U.S.-led coalition to encircle Raqqa. A spokesman for the Syrian Democratic Forces says, quote, we expect that within a few weeks there will be a siege of the city. Uh, we know that there's, I believe, additional forces on the way. We know that the siege is underway on Mosul. So, Jim, it looks like there's progress on that front. We know that the air sorties have picked up in recent weeks, uh, something Trump promised would happen, uh, and seems to be uh, having an effect here as well. So it looks like progress is on the way. It is. Uh, I actually came to this came to my attention with a uh, column by Matthew Continetti uh, entitled The ISIS Endgame. Uh, and one of his points is to be to be concerned about mission creep in Syria af if and when uh, the Syrian, you know, the, the Islamic State falls and, and Raqqa becomes uh, uh, controlled by the Free Syrian Army. Um, but it's anyway, we, we, you know, we've started military operations against ISIS, uh, you know, more than a year ago, probably two years ago. Uh, and there was kind of this sense that it was, you know, it was airstrikes. They talked about how they were destroying the oil infrastructure and things like that. But it... Um, it seemed to be really going at a plotting pace. And uh, so this, this, you know, this revelation that actually, you know, one, we've deployed more troops than, uh, than I think most Americans know into Syria. And also that we are, you know, the forces we are backing um, are really taking it to ISIS and in fact are knocking on the door of their capital. Um, I, you know, a lot of us kind of had this feeling that there was this, this state of, of stasis, that this uh, stalemate. The other common phrase you heard a lot of, well, there really aren't any good guys in Syria. There is no uh, uh, good forces on the ground, certainly not one that was strong enough to, uh, to defeat ISIS. Well, maybe that wasn't the case after all. You know, the, the basically, the, the combination of, of uh, 
U.S. airstrikes and these ground forces, and now apparently it looks like the U.S. contingent of Marines have been, are positioning heavy artillery uh, for the fight to take over Mosul and, and uh, Raqqa. Uh, within a couple of weeks, there's supposed to be this siege of Raqqa. This could be a very big deal, um, not just for the symbolism, but I think also that there's this fantastic article in The Atlantic back in 2015 uh, talk to basically not just every expert on ISIS, but people within ISIS, the ones who you could, and this is by name Graham Wood, probably the best and most detailed, uh, lengthy look into the philosophy of ISIS and what makes ISIS different from every other uh, terror, Islamist terrorist group out there. And one of the key, biggest and most key points is ISIS controls territory. Right. Al Qaeda is operating in the back alleys of all kinds of corners, and it's going to be really, really tough to track tough to track down every last cell, every last person who decides uh, they want to sign up with the cause of bin Laden. And, you know, uh, they may or may not be in touch with Zawahiri and guys like that. Now, then there's ISIS, though. And what made ISIS stand apart from all these other groups is their claim. We are the caliphate. We are literally the Islamic state. We are a government. We are a nation. We are a kingdom. We are different from all those other groups that claim to be fighting in the in the in the name of all the Muslim people. We have established the kingdom. We have taken over territory and this is what makes us great. And here's our capital city and we are on the march and expanding outward and all that stuff. Well, once you take away their territory, <laughs> once you take away their capital city, all of a sudden they don't have that claim to legitimacy anymore. Now, is this going to mean that ISIS goes away forever? No, but it's really going to be um, not just a, a symbolic you know, fight, not just a, a serious military fight, uh, a defeat for them. But basically they will have that, that element that made them special, the element that made your typical disgruntled, angry Muslim look to them as the real, you know, army against the decadent West. The, you know, they lose what makes them unique, uh, and they become just another Islamist terrorist group. And some people are going to say, well, that's, that's good, but it's not exactly what we want. But I think this is a necessary step to defeating them. Um, and really kind of, this is a, a serious punch in the mouth for the cause of Islamic jihadism. So um, I salute that. It's a good sign. I think Continetti's points about being concerned about uh, taking over and the fears of nation building in Syria and, and what happens the day after Raqqa falls and stuff like that, how long U.S. troops should do all perfectly legitimate points. But I do think it's worth uh, acknowledging the fact that ISIS, which, you know, not too long ago looked like this new great menace of our era, uh, could be on the verge of a fairly serious defeat uh, in the not too distant future. Yeah, certainly in Iraq anyway. They obviously have tentacles into other parts of the world and throughout the region, but that would be a huge uh, blow to their reputation and their uh, claim of a caliphate. Uh, Jim, I've got good and bad news in response to what you just said. The bad news for ISIS, and which really means good news, uh, is Simply Safe won't help them when they've got a JDAM coming through the front door. <laughs> The good news is, is that for everybody else who is not on the receiving end of American-led munitions, your home can be much, much safer with the help of Simply Safe Home Security. We've talked uh, for, for weeks now about this story out of California where a woman who was hired to clean homes was stealing from them at the same time. So you're paying somebody to take care of your home. They burglarize you. But it, it's not just the cleaning lady, quote unquote. It could be anybody. You know, you try to give your key to somebody. Maybe you moved into a new neighborhood. Those neighbors across the street seem normal. I'll give them the code just in case uh, they need it. No, sometimes that's not the best move either. We're not trying to make you paranoid. We're trying to get you ready and to, to give you a secure home. And so a regular security system won't necessarily protect you from the people that you think you know and trust. So what can you do? Well, you can get Simply Safe, which now makes it possible to know what's going on at your home at any time. If you want to check in, you can just live stream footage from the Simply Safe camera in your home directly to your smartphone anytime you like. You can get text message and email alerts when someone arms or disarms your system so you can be sure and confident that your home is safe. So for 24-7 protection you can really trust, go to simplysafe.com slash ricochet. That's spelled S-I-M-P-L-I-S-A-F-E. Dot com. Order a Simply Safe home security system today, and you'll even get our special 10% discount. Again, go now, simplysafe.com slash ricochet. On to our third good martini, Jim. It's so nice to have good martinis, uh, multiple, multiple good martinis. Uh, this is courtesy of CNN Money. 
The U.S. economy added a robust 235,000 jobs in February, according to the Labor Department. On Friday, the unemployment rate ticked down to 4.7 from 4.8 percent in the previous month. It's a vast improvement from 2009 when unemployment peaked at 10 percent after the financial crisis. Economists still think it'll be challenging for Trump to come through on his promise of 25 million new jobs in the next 10 years since the unemployment rate is already low. But other good news, wage growth continued to show signs of progress after persisting at a sluggish pace for years. Wages grew a solid 2.8 percent in February compared with a year ago. Manufacturing adding 28,000 jobs, uh, construction adding 58,000 jobs. So robust news. Uh, Sounds like this will lead the Fed to raising uh, short-term interest rates by a quarter point. So what we save actually earns us some more money. Uh, Jim, obviously, we're as the Obama folks will tell you, we've had uh, job growth month after month after month after month. But when you look at the wage growth and some of the key sectors that are adding jobs, uh, there's reason for additional excitement. Yeah, uh, this is good news on a on a bunch of uh, uh, fronts. One of them, um, just the idea that there's not bad news, right? If there had been any <laughs> indication of a downturn or slowdown, oh, there the Trump recession has begun. It would, we would have. Uh, gotten a great deal of that. But the second thing is that uh, this is a really good number. Now, we had gotten a, uh, a payroll company report from the middle of the week that pointed to a super duper phenomenal number. Uh, and this number isn't quite that, but it's not. It's still pretty darn good and plenty of reason for cheer. Uh, what jumped out at me is the uh, wage growth number, which uh, people had said that, yes, the uh, uh, the the unemployment rate had been steadily declining, but you know, one, did people feel it? Did people feel prosperity? Um, if you had a really nice job before the Great Recession, you go and you uh, find another job that pays half of what it used to. Are you in better? Sh- you know, like yeah, you're not unemployed anymore, but you don't feel like you're prospering or getting ahead. The American uh, dream seems further away, um, and every other you know lament we've heard about the economy over these past uh, couple you know eight years or so. Uh, this, if this is a re- recovery, it's a slow and sluggish and very uneven recovery in a lot of places. Um, so now we have a nice big month of job growth, a nice big month of uh, uh, wage growth and economic confidence is rising. And we might be on the verge of what something would really feel like a serious recovery, an economic boom. Something would really make you, us uh, – uh, broadly shared prosperity. And I don't know about you, we have this feeling that if, you know, you have real genuine economic growth and people are hiring and people are getting raises and people are uh, feeling confident about applying for a better job and getting that better job, now their income comes up a little bit higher. And keeping this circle of uh, confidence for the future, they're buying, making bigger purchases, they feel better about uh, uh, taking out a loan to, to get a mortgage or something like that. This is, you know, these are the causes a virtuous circle instead of the vicious circle that we were in for a while. So um, I think there's, you know, great potential here. Uh, You don't want to count any chickens before they hatch. But look, um, when you look at a jobs number and just about everybody across the board is like, yeah, it's pretty darn good. Um, Hey, let's take it. It's kind of tough to find those. And uh, maybe we're on the verge of a real genuine uh, economic recovery, which can only be good for the United States. Jim, uh, the private sector report you referred to, I think, was pretty close to 300,000. This one's 235. I don't know if you can chalk that all up to uh, potential losses of, of government jobs. So, you know, if Trump just doesn't appoint people to a lot of these positions, <laughs> uh, the private sector numbers are going to be fantastic. It's going to be the federal numbers that are going to be dragging us down here, which in the end isn't necessarily a bad thing. Well, I'm wondering how many uh, ca- how many you know positions he's supposed to appoint to that he hasn't uh... – uh, filled yet. I think I've gone down the list. I know that uh, FEMA, uh, Center for Immig- uh, Customs and Immigration Services, which you'd think would be a priority in the Trump administration, don't you think, Greg? <laughs> yes. um, uh, ATF, right? This is a very pro gun. All right now, all these positions are Obama holdovers or, or permanent uh, uh, staffers. So I don't know about you, Greg. He could take it, you know, this would, would not actually make a dent in the unemployment numbers, but like there's like 2,000 jobs waiting to be filled as is, Mr. President. Let's get cracking. <laughs> Come on, chop, chop. <laughs> That's the other way of looking at it. Uh, well, Jim, uh, speaking of the, the streak of, of job creation, our streak of not being interrupted uh, during our podcast uh, <laughs> is at an astronomical uh, pace at this point. It's been a very long time, other than some technical glitches perhaps along the way. But uh, being interrupted by children has not happened in a very long time. Can't say the same for an expert on North Korea, South Korea policy who was being interviewed by the BBC. There's a lot of turmoil in South Korea right now. A court there just 
upheld the impeachment of the South Korean president. So there's some turmoil. There'll be some new elections. And so the BBC was interviewing this guy. Uh, and the, you got to see the video. It's viral right now. So it's pretty hard to miss if you go on social media. But he's doing this serious interview. And then his toddler uh, child walks in. And then the baby just pushes its way in with the uh, the, the walking uh, rolly thing that, that babies do before they can walk. And then his wife comes in and drags about it. It's just hilarious. Take a listen. Uh, and what will it mean for... Uh... For the wider region, I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. That's part of the, um, my apologies. <laughs> um, what is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North... Uh, Sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year because of North Korea's behavior. Uh, most recently, the use of VX gas in the airport in Malaysia that indicates that North Korea really doesn't follow global norms. Oh, Jim, as dads, we could totally relate to that. The, the, the awkward part, of course, is the wife diving in there and trying to grab the kids and yank them out and quietly close the door. But what, of course, nobody counts on is the eruption when you remove the kids from the room. Even though the door is closed, the wailing still comes through. Um, we've all been there if we've got the kids. I was going to say, good sir for uh, that British television, Mr. Expert on, on Korea. We've all been there. We <laughs> forgive you. It happens. There's no need for shame. Uh, this is work-life balance for a lot of working parents and things like that. And uh, I think about all the number of times my sons have made unex unplanned appearances on the Hugh Hewitt show and occasionally Bill Bennett's morning show. Um, really eager to talk to daddy at the least convenient time and <laughs> doing my best to not blurt out their names on national air. So, uh, you know, thank you for the, the, the host is very good natured about it. Everybody's good. I notice he never stops looking at the screen. He knows <laughs> there's trouble behind him, but he doesn't see it. And I mean, we're assuming it's his wife. Maybe it's the, the babysitter or the nanny or somebody, um, skids in there on socks like Tom Cruise and risky business. <laughs> Because <laughs> the first one is your – the toddler kind of strides in with this fantastic strut. <laughs> She's having a fantastic day and can't wait to talk to daddy who's uh, unbeknownst to him uh, – to her, you know, Skyping or, or doing live. And you're like, oh, this is going to happen. But it's the second child coming in where you're like, OK, here comes trouble. <laughs> right? Clearly, it's like, wait, where did my big sister go? I got to see what's going on in this room. And, of course, it's this <laughs> giant clunking thing because then the poor mom or nanny comes in there and is trying to pull both of them out of the room. <laughs> And this older child, the toddler, nearly gets run over by the little romper cage uh, of the of the, uh, the the younger child. So it is chaotic. It's this wonderfully chaotic. It is this complete dead bad scene as you know everything is blowing up behind him. So um, we all kind of needed a good happy laugh about that. And and uh, so my I salute this family. The family that appears on BBC together will probably thrive together for a very long time. <laughs> Just a great laugh at the end of the week. As always, we need such a thing. Jim, have a good weekend. Talk to you Monday. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great weekend, everyone. And don't forget to visit our friends at Simply Safe Home Security, simplysafe.com slash ricochet. Join us Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.